Right, so today, um, actually this is lecture nine. Um, <clears throat> it's all about phytoremediations. Phytoremediations means uh, using plant uh, or vegetations to remove pollutants from groundwater or soil. Uh, what we are going to focus mostly on groundwater today, uh, but it's the same concept as uh, removing contaminants from soil. Uh, just one extra step, uh, plant directly cannot take out from soil. Uh, the contaminant has to release from uh, soil to water and before that the plants can take through water. So again, it's just one extra step. Uh, the desorption has to happen. The soil has to release that first because you can't really take soil particles inside the plant. But there are other ways also. We'll just give some um, uh, differentiation between those two processes, but uh, it's the same concept. Um, few announcement, um, homework three, it was due to yesterday uh, or today actually. So I extended it to February 4, uh, Thursday midnight. Uh, so you have two more days to work on it. And this is the last homework. Uh, or originally we had another homework, which is uh, not quantitative. I just removed it and what we're gonna do is we're gonna solve that in the class so that you have some practice. But I'll tell this, homework, you have everything that you need for the midterms, long questions. Short questions will be related to quiz and other factors. So uh, you already have been familiar with, uh, with it. Uh, again, project outline, I have, uh, you have to, the moment I meet with you and you discuss with me, that's I count that you have worked on it and then continue to evolve with that. So meet me at least once. Uh, I know that some of group I have not met some group I already met, uh, some group even twice. Uh, so it's very helpful for you guys to meet 10, 15 minutes. You don't have to work on something to meet me. You, you can just come and discuss uh, what you think about and we can work together. Um, the whole idea is to learn how to process, how to start with outline. So set a time with me uh, or TA, uh, whichever you prefer, it's fine. Mm, but um, as a group, you should um, take that initiative and have a um, Zoom link on your own so that I meet for 10, 15 minutes, then I leave, you guys can continue to discuss. And you can use the same Zoom link for the throughout the quarters to meet uh, your colleagues and uh, discuss the project. Again, office hour uh, is two to three. I know like two or three students shows up uh, every, every um, week. Uh, if this time is not preferable to you, I know that 25%, uh, 50% at least, Accept, uh, more than 50% say this works for you. Uh, so again, it's not like mandatory that you have to show up just to let you know that it's there. Um, so every week, Monday, two to 3 p.m. So I'm there. Um, then upcoming exam, uh, quiz two, uh, release the solutions or not the solutions, the grade. Uh, I'll discuss that at the end of this class uh, about uh, the scores and all that. Um, but quiz three is every two weeks we have a quiz. The idea here is that you you learn the concept. There is no much, not much homework. So you're just learning the uh, simple questions uh, so that you know how to apply those for your project. So quiz three will be on lecture eight, nine, and 10. So eight is last class on bioremediations. Nine will be phytoremediations and 10th will be nanotechnology. So these are the three uh, classes that uh, the uh, midterm or the quiz number three would be. And midterms exams will be on February 16th. That's uh, um, the following week, week seven. Uh, again, it's around two hours. Um, one of the students asked questions, it's going to be as, even though I said three hour in the C-153, it took longer. Uh, I learned my lesson. I want to tell that um, I also learned what not to do. Uh, I don't want you guys to spend more than two hours. Well, that's my intention. Um, but I severely underestimated uh, in C-153. Uh, so this will be uh, a two hour exams, uh, but I'll give you three hours here. Uh, so that time is not a constraint. And the question will be very similar to uh, homework, at least long questions. Um, so there'll be two long questions and one um, multiple choice. Uh, the first questions will have 10 different short questions, like how C-153 but it's a small, fewer number of questions. Uh, the long question, you have only two. Again, it's on homework one and three, uh, essentially homework two and three. 
one is not really, I don't know whether you have a lot of calculations, but if there is a calculation that's related to, I think, short questions. Um, again, um, uh, midterms will be up to uh, week five. Uh, so that means anything covered this week will be part of the midterms. So week six will be mostly uh, we will cover new topic, but you don't have to worry about for that midterms. And you can also use week six for your preparation time for uh, midterms on week seven. And uh, that's all. So any question? Let me see chat window. Um, okay, so there is a, um, is language equation given article before the table goes? Uh, so let me discuss the homework uh, pretty quickly because somebody asked um, the question. So let me, um, just open the homework and see homework number three. So let me open the question so that you can all see what I discussed. Okay, so um, let me do one thing. Let me add a new slides so that um, Let me see how do I add a new site. No, so this is not new slide. Let's see. Mm. Okay, here it is, new slide, <clears throat> blank page. Okay, all right, so I'm gonna write it here. So the, there are some question on problem one, should we use Langmuir equation given on the articles right before the tables? Yes, use the Langmuir equation. And Langmuir equation is the same all the time. So if I uh, open the articles, the Langmuir equation was given is QE, is uh, QM, B, C, E divided by, one plus B C. So let's see what those numbers are. C E is the concentrations, concentration in water after absorption. This is key, not before absorption. This is after equilibrium. And that means contaminants are absorbed already. After absorptions. And Q E is the concentration in in solid. So the Unit is usually milligram of pollutants by gram or kilogram of um, solid, which is soil or activated carbon or anything that you are thinking about. This is milligram of pollutants by liter of water. Okay. And so QM is the maximum amount of contaminant that can absorb on on the on that particular solid. So that's a constant. Okay. And the unit is same as this unit will be same. And I know that some people ask, some, somebody asked on the campus where B is also a constant and it has no unit. So you can see if you see the matching the unit, uh, this QE unit has to be same as this unit. So these two should be canceled. Um, okay, so. Um, and the, the number table four gives you, table four gives you um, value for values for QM and B. And then you should be able to calculate that. Okay, so that's question two, uh, question one. Uh, let me see. Um, another page, so that's uh, the question was about question three, three of homework. So let's see what's the question. I'm going to see the homework question here. So um, if you open the handout, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you the handout. So that question is already solved in your handout uh, 
uh, example 9.2 and uh, so exactly that question is solved for one one uh, one contaminant so follow that one but what i'm going to do is i'm going to show you on the ccle so that you should be able to cover that uh, so let me see how i unshare okay that's uh, let's see where this one is one notes Okay, so if you um, let me share the screen so that you know what I'm talking about. So stop share, share screen. That's uh, okay. So if you see, this is a um, CCLE. So I'm on week three. <clears throat> if you go to uh, week three, then there is a call um, reading Exito. So if you open that one, you have this book chapter, Co-chemical Processes. Then you have air stripping. Tell you about everything that you need to know, uh, fundamentals that we cover. And then you tell you a little bit more about different factors that we don't have to remember all the things. But the question you want to go for is this, example 9.2. So if you see example 9.2, it, it gives you all the, what's the contaminant inside, what's the transfer rate, temperatures, Henry constants, and also give you different ideas, column diameters, heights, all that factor. And then you have to calculate uh, what should be the height of the stripping tower so that it can remove uh, the pollutants. So um, if you follow this in every steps, it's uh, it's force calculate liquid loading loading rates. So liquid loading rates is the same as flow, uh, flow per unit area. Um, but you know if you see how the um, the loading rate, the units here is moles moles of water per second per square meter. Okay, so that means uh, this is second. But you can also do the same thing as if you say uh, kilogram of or gram of water per second per meter square. It's, it's, it's okay, whichever you need to use. Here they use a, a moles per water and you know that 18 gram equal to one mole of water. So it's, it's the same conversion. The first thing you have to do is you have to calculate all these value that's given here, right? So um, for instance, um, let's say the very first one, if I see solution, the very first thing you have to solve is STU because the G height is equal to NTU, number of transformation unit times STU. STU means uh, what's the <clears throat> size of the, um, the height of one transform unit. And STU is a uh, L over MW, KLA. So KLA is the mass transfer, which is already given to you. This is a molar, so this basically M, MW, which is, a, let me just to be sure. Yeah, so everything else, you know, MW is a molar density of water. So this is a MW is density of water. So that's 1000, you know that um, if you take one meter cube of water, which is 1000 liter, is going to be one liter is 1000 kilogram, kilogram. Okay, let me write this uh, clearly. Professor, we can't see what you're writing. Oh, I see, I share this one here. Okay, okay, got it. So uh, let me unfair this one. So I just want to write that, look at example 9.2. That's, that's what you have to do there. And then the extra step is you have to plot um, uh, plot concentration or the height as a function of different things. So that's you need Excel or Google Sheet or MATLAB or R or any any kind of graphical software that you you can use to uh, plot because you have the equations. You just vary one parameter; it will just give you a different number. Um, so those are the um, the solution. So let me unshare this one. And then I can share my screen. 
what I'm doing here. Okay, so again, uh, question number three, example nine, handout, just exactly same thing. Um, you're un you are just going to, the most of the questions are G or the height of um, the, the stripping tower is a function of, you know that it's a function of flow rate of water. It's also a function of flow rate of air. You also know that it's a function of a uh, stripping factor, S or R, whatever, you, doesn't matter, you know, you can write. Um, so that's the unit. So as long as you know how the equations has these terms, then you should be able to calculate. I think um, stripping factor is, uh, let me write this one. Um, um, S Henry constant, dimensional Henry constant times Q air divided by um, Q water. Stripping factor sometimes is used as R, you know, that's just the notations. So, and you know this one, NTU is a function of R or S stripping factors, okay? And concentrations, let me write this one. If you see that equations in the, and also C in, C out. So as long as you know this equation, you can plot those value, you will get answers, okay? So that means, if you vary any of this term, the, any of these parameters, your G will vary. And that's what we are going to plot. And how do you calculate that? This is basically that, you know. So um, the STU is the loading rate, which is the amount of water you add per unit, uh, per unit areas per second or per unit time. Um, so that you can express as a moles per second per meter square or just gram per second per meter square. The key here is that the L and density should have similar unit. Uh, so if you express density as a kilo, kilogram per meter cube, you should express also the loading rate as kilogram per second per um, meter square. But if you use moles per second per meter square, then you also have to use moles per meter cube. How do you convert moles per gram or kilogram? You This is a conversion formula. Okay, so again, uh, look at example 9.2. If you have difficulty how to do this one, uh, you should be uh, ask questions on campus where and I will help answer that. Okay, so again, I want you guys to try this one because, and also I highly encourage you to use um, Google Sheet um, or Excel. Excel, uh, Google Sheet is free, so that's fine, no, or MATLAB, or any, any graphical software. The reason I'm asking you to do this one is you, uh, if, you uh, if you save it uh, for future in the exam time, if I give you a question which is very similar to this, you just change the number, you get the answer uh, immediately if you linked everything together. Uh, uh, to, so that's why it's very helpful for you to invest that time now so that in exam time, you just don't have to spend so much time doing it again and again. Uh, it's, exam questions are similar, that's why I say. So do it, do it for uh, exam, okay? So save it. Any question as far as concept? I have a question. Um, for the loading rate, could we get that from the area? Because I thought we mentioned before in one of the other classes that the loading rate is equal to the water pumping rate divided by the area. Exactly. So this is flow rate divided by area of that unit. So instead of using the density of water, could I just do um, HTU equals loading rate over the uh, that constant uh, <laughs> so coefficient? Yeah, so you can do that one. Just know that what's the unit of this, right? Um, so this unit has to cancel out. Uh, this unit is one, let's say KLA, unit is one over time, okay? And L over MW has to be one over time. So as long as your units cancel out, so it should be fine. Okay, thank you. 
yeah, this is basically you are saying how much, if you see what does that mean here, you know, it's basically how much you are loading per second, right? So it's one over second. Loading rate is a, um, is a, uh, let's see, units, wherever that unit is. Um, let me check my, okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna tell you what my answer is for HTU. So HTU, my answer is 2.2 um, 2 .2 meters, okay. That's my answer for um, what I got. You, know, you can check again, I'm not looking for final correct answer. I look for your process, so it should be fine. And if you want to know what, which one will fail, um, so in based on me or my calculations, what I found, Benjin, uh, Tolwin, and Ethyl Benjin can't be removed. This can't be removed. If g equal to 10 meters, okay, because the amount of the height required to remove or achieve that final concentration is more than 10 meter. Um, so that's just a, you know, this is just a my calculation so that you see. But again, it's not the final answer. You should know the processes. But final answers are um, at least the process. Process is very important for you to understand to ask uh, answer short questions as well as the, should know at least how to do it. And the graphs are already part of the slide. If you see the slides I made, these are actually the solutions, the, the final graph. So you should match them or at least see if you get similar to that answers or not. All right, so that's homework. Uh, any other question? All right, so let's get to the today's class. Uh, so today we are going to learn about uh, phytoremediations. I know that many of you have um, um, projects related to um, uh, remediations of uh, contaminated land. And phytoremediation could be one of the long-term strategy uh, where, you know, because uh, it's basically using plants to remove pollutants from groundwater as well as soil. And plants are healthy, plants are natural, plants are, uh, you know, that's, uh, pretty good, you know, that's like nature. So that's why it's pretty uh, um, attractive technology, but it has its limitations. So we'll learn about that. And briefly, I'll explain how it works. You know, you'll not go details about it because it's just a one class. Phytoremediation can be entire, entire um, course on its own. Uh, so we'll not go for fully detailed, you just know the principle. And then we'll also, most important, you'll learn what kind of pollutants can be removed by factory remediations because that's essential for your project. If you have a site, you know these are the pollutants, you can consider factory remediations at least to some extent. At the end, we'll do some calculations. You'll see also see what's the design constraints where you can apply factory remediations. And also before that, I just want to say that today, February 2nd is World's Wetland Day. If you know what is wetland, it just sounds how it is, you know, wetland, you know, any, any land which is filled with uh, at least uh, some water, shallow water. And you can see that the marsh on this like here, it's a nice pictures, illustrations. Wetland um, remove a lot of pollutants. Uh, wetlands are the nature's cleaning, wetland, wetland is the nature's wastewater treatment plants, okay? So if you allow the water to pass on a uh, surface like here, um, the plants are able to remove some pollutants and uh, the microorganisms at the near the sediments, they remove way a lot more pollutants and also the um, sunlight can remove some pollutants. So this is how nature remove pollutants uh, in uh, contaminated water. And so, um, so just know that this is, a, this is one of the green infrastructures that will cover next quarter. So wetland is one of the green infrastructure. Um, so again, uh, wetland plant is the one of the um, significant design component of wetland, at least some of the wetland. Um, plant doesn't have to be there to design a wetland, but um, um, there is a natural wetland has plants. And um, 
So phytoremediation is part of the design. So let's think of what is phytoremediation means. You know, phytoremediation means using plants to remove pollutants, but it's not like uh, just one process. There are many different processes. So let's go through one by one. So always contamination start from the roots. Okay, that's where the contaminants move and then move upward. So think of let's say what is the first term here? Phyto extraction. What does that even mean? As you see in the picture, phyto extraction means now root is going to take up some of the pollutants away. So here the pollutants are in, and you can see this is M plus. It's usually metals. Okay, so metal organic pollutants. It has to be small enough molecule, and it should be able to in um, get into the the root structure. So root has opening. You know those are has to be have. Uh, find a way to get into that. Not all pollutants can get inside um, because root use transporter genes. Uh, uh, so some genes, you know, that uh, are the transporter molecules, it bind with that pollutant, so it takes it inside. Some pollutants can directly get inside. So those are the mechanism you have to understand. But phyto extraction means basically a sponge. The, or the think of, you know, we use a, um, when we, drink water, if you use a straw, that's exactly how it is. You now the roots are straw, they, they absorb or the, uh, remove the pollutants from soil. And then they can transport into the plant root. If you think of phytostabilizations, here the difference between phytoextraction and phytostabilization is root doesn't take anything inside. What it does, it, it lets the pollutants, uh, so it's like a defense mechanism. So phytostabilization means if a outside root, okay? And it is what it sounds like is stabilization means you, um, you, uh, you fix the pollutant at one location so that it don't move around in the groundwater. So phytostabilization, the, the root mechanism, the common mechanism is precipitation. So if you see, what does that mean? So what precipitation means you now? Precipitation means you have, um, you know, if you think of, uh, that's the mostly salt precipitate, the same way as, or another way to say is, uh, if you have uh, a pollutants which move around, that's become toxic because, you know, groundwater is going to be polluted because of that. But what root does, it, it, um, it release some kind of um, chillant or some kind of, uh, um, it can change the chemistry around the root so that these pollutants will start start aggregating with each other, not aggregating, they're like sticking with each other, like you see over here. So that's called precipitation. It means the more pollutant, it becomes a salt. It's not dissolved anymore. So it's basically opposite to, to dissolutions. Okay, so that means you, um, all the, so the way root works is they take the pH uh, many of the metals, for instance, root will change the pH because uh, they can take the proton out and in from the root uh, from the root zone. If you increase the pH, that means OH is going to increase. If OH is going to increase, let's say uh, I'm just throwing a number here. Okay, let's say let's say you have a uh, copper, then this OH become copper hydroxide and it's going to precipitate. S means solid. And when it's solid, it's no longer in water anymore. So that's the called phytostabilization. So pH is one of the factors. Sometimes they also have root escudates, uh, like uh, molecules that can bind with that metals. And then those, they become, they like bind at different part of the molecules and they will remove it. So this is mostly a defense mechanism of plant, okay? So, so this is a defense, um, mechanism. This is how um, plant avoid toxicity. Okay? They don't really want it. So that's how they can create it so that the signals, so, so root, how the root signals, all that stuff is more science behind it. Let's think of phytodegradations. Phytodegradation is something like a lot of people really work on. Uh, it means like how biodegradation works. In, so here, the pollutant itself is actually transformed to another type of pollutant. It breaks into smaller pieces. Like you see visually, 
one, this is a molecules, and this one is a transformed. Original. So it's like bioremediation. So now how it works? It's the same way. It has root enzymes, or uh, root uh, root pro produce SQ dates, and also those will. So root. So let's say. So root SQ dates means you know it's like a kind of chemical sterilize. Mostly these are organic acid. Organic acid and many other types of organic polymers and those polymers are uh, the acids can react you know that's how it can destroy some minerals or the pollutants in fact this is one of the methods how asbestos sites are remediated or at least people think of remediating because the the root will produce this uh, organic acid and that organic acid will dissolve asbestos mineral around it and make it less toxic um, so that's one of the way, but organic pollutants are like that. And phytostimulations, mostly metals, okay? Because organics are not easily precipitated out, uh, very low concentration. So they usually they degrade them or they take it inside. Metals are the things they don't want. Um, so um, they can uh, stabilize by using phytostimulations. Let's see what's the other one. Phytostimulations. This is not like root actively participated. Phytostimulations means uh, it uh, it stimulate the microorganism around it. So you have, let's say you have bacteria or fungi presents in the soil, right? So those those bacteria and fungi uh, can take those pollutants and degrade it uh, into carbon dioxide. So what they do is the root create an environment where the, these microorganisms are surviving and they are doing degradations. So it's more like using plants to enhance biodegradations of pollutants. Uh, so if you know how biodegradation works, think of how root can able to help it. Uh, so a lot of times root provide that you know, we eat fruits, right? So root is very good at creating carbohydrates or um, those kind of um, the organics um, uh, molecules. So they produce these organic molecules so that they can mix the, um, the microorganism around it uh, more uh, healthy. And the question is why they do it? I mean, why they are going to feed something else now? So what they get out of it? So one example I'll give you is um, think of a mycorrhizal fungi, it means root association with a fungi. So many fungi grow near the root zone fungi are not able to, um, they are not able to get carbon dioxide, carbon uh, nutrients or carbohydrates on their own. So they need a plant to provide them that. So in return, what fungi does is because root cannot penetrate a lot of places. So once the, these fungi infect them, infect in a good way, uh, what they do is they have lots of filaments. So they grow, it's like a mat, you know, many fungi has miles and miles long of root ne uh, networks of filaments. Uh, so these filaments grow around and those fungi are very good at producing organic acid. So they produce organic acid, dissolve the phosphate and nutrients, those are trapped inside the rock. And um, then those nutrients are now available for the plants. So it's like a like exchange program. Plants will give them the, um, give them the carbohydrates or organics and the fungi will help them provide, get the nutrients. And if you have also low moisture, uh, these fungi can actually go into different locations because they can grow as fast, very fast compared to roots. A growing root is uh, root is more expensive. Uh, so it's like, you know, you, you have a delivery system. You, know, you don't want to go to Pizza Hut, somebody's delivering you. The same thing, fungi are very easy to move around, not move by themselves. Uh, they can move uh, because of the filaments growth. Uh, so this is the phytostimulation. So, but point is, once you have phyto extractions, then things will start changing. You know, that's where pollutants move here, and they have to go in different locations. Okay. So now, once the pollutants are inside, what happened to them? They are, they are in water, and those are carried by the, uh, the the stomach, the cell, and uh, they go move up. You know, so once they move up. 
above plants, there one of the three things could happen. A phyto extraction again, it can accumulate in the um, in the in the leaves, and so if you accumulate in the leaves, you can take up the leaves, and after the end of the all the leaves fall down, you can carry, take the leaves out, and you can extract um, those uh, elements. That way, you could be able to harvest if you have a sufficient amount. And uh, phyto degradations, the plant itself can can degrade inside the leaves and convert them to to macromolecules. Okay. Uh, so why plant do that? Because there are some plant enzyme which looks very similar to pollutant. So they think if I take these organic pollutants, they could I could change it and functionalize and use them as a uh, similar product. So that is also another factor. And the way to study is you you have organic molecule. Basically, anything you talk about here, this can be metal. But phytodegradations, anytime you hear degradations, it's organic because metals cannot be degraded, okay? So organic molecules um, is transferred, um, transform to plant metabolites. Okay. So that's phytodegradations externally. Huh? And that's how far they can they uh, they can uh, assimilate in the fruits, uh, all that other factor. So that's why a lot of times people talk about applying um, applying um, recycled water on farm so that they can reduce the cost. But this is the exact problem. You know? So if you apply recycled water and there are some pollutants uh, which are present micronutrients, those uh, those plants can take it and they can also accumulate in. Uh, spinach or the fruits and all that factor. So you don't want to eat them if there is a way. Um, so that's another thing to uh, check. The last one is basically plants looks like a, it's like a straw which takes the volatile organic compounds, they release it, they take it, they didn't realize this is something they don't need it. So they, uh, because the the biggest factor plant do is a, is a water pump. If you think what plant do, plant is a water pump. Okay, so think of a pump. You have groundwater. And then you atmosphere. Plant does that all the time to get nutrients and keep them cool. Okay, so that's what plants do. They breathe all the time. That's how they release everything from their body. Okay. So they really you know that. They are the in fact biggest driver for for uh, sometimes you know removing water from soil. You know that's what they do all the time, pumping water all the time. So those waters are polluted, then this will be also removed from the system. So as they move water, they can anything dissolved in water can be also extracted or released into atmosphere. So these are the mechanism. So now we are going to apply this mechanism to design differential treatments. So any question? Are some plants better at phytoremediation than others? Like what makes a plant like do it less? Yes, uh, we'll get to that, but just let's see what we learn here. We learned that they have different mechanism, right? Uh, so based on pollutants, uh, some, uh, you know, the, the plants number one, if you have lots of pollutants, it's toxic to also plant, right? So that's the first criteria. Is this pollutant toxic to the plants? Then they can't really phytoremediate; they will die, right? Uh, so you got to have at least the plants who survive or have a defense mechanism uh, to to grow even in that condition where you have a lot of pollutants. And then also, you know, the plant root structure where they go. Uh, if, yes. So the short answer is yes. Every plants work differently, and some plants are better than other. So think of sunflower. Sunflower is a very popular phytoremediation plant. And uh, if you think of, you know, the biggest, uh, one of the biggest uh, radioactive accident, anybody remember what is that? Where is this? Biggest radioactive uh, accident happens, you know, um, nuclear plant disaster. Uh, say again, Hannah? Chernobyl? Yes, yes. So that, 
So that's the one. Number two is also the tsunami hit Japan, and that's another time when uh, the nuclear power plants uh, failed, right? So these are the two biggest ones. Uh, in, in Russia, the one that happens, it is spread the radioactive materials around the locations. So what they did is they put lots of the sunflower plant. The reason is sunflower plant can extract these radioactive elements and, and uh, put in the plants. You know, that's how they, they can then take the plants away. Uh, so sunflower plant is one of the most popular um, phytoremediation um, species. Others are grass species. Another thing to think of is also the roots, how far this root can migrate. And so all these things we'll discuss. But point is, if you want to think of mechanism, this is what it does. You have plants here. Um, and this is what you can test. You now we, we can put a plants in a, in a lab. Uh, so um, if you have plants here, you know, these are the, um, let me see, this person is, should not call me this time. Let's see. Sorry about that. <clears throat> I have my phone is off, but the same, everything is connected. So even my phone is off the, the computer takes the call. All right, so this is how we do a uh, plant uh, plant uh, phytoremediation strategy, how, where they go, what happens. Uh, so we grow the plant and then we see, look at, you know, how much of the pollutants stick with the root because they can directly just absorb on the root. So you take the roots away and you, you wash them and then you dissolve it in an acid. And then all the things in the, um, on the roots will come out. You know, that, that's where you are going to look for how much bioabsorption happens. Then you also take the roots, leaves, everything else, and then you see, uh, you collect the vapors, everything else. Then you uh, you look at the uh, volatilizations or um, the one we discussed now is a uh, phytovolatilizations. And then we also take up all these as we de we destroy the plant and then we extract plant molecules and try to look for any structure similar structure as the original con. Uh, contaminants and see if there is a metabolite, known metabolite. And um, those are basically used math spec to examine those. Um, so um, just to know that plant is not necessarily just phytoremediation, it's also bioremediation along with that. So the reason we just discussed is that plants can also stimulate microorganism like uh, fungi and those uh, also plant can release the students that could transform some of the pollutants uh, or they can solve as enzymes uh, for that microbial communities. And because plants are, you know, the, basically these are organic, right? So they produce fruits, the same thing, they can same carbohydrate, they can pump out in the roots. So that increase the carbon, that stimulate the microbial um, um, activities, that means it can also uh, degrade other pollutants alongside that. And again, plants provide these habitats because of root, it aerate, it also provide oxygen because they also release oxygen up. They can also release oxygen into the uh, root you know, so that you can create this aerobic zone. And aerobic zones are important. You know that oxygen at the roots helpful for a lot of factors. You know, that's, so that's what plants do. That means they can also help the microorganism having that aerobic oxidations. So these are the different things. So the idea here is that you have plant. Um, just let's say plant. Oh, it looked like a man here. Uh, anyway, so this is a, I put many legs, so that means become a plant. And so this root, and then you have root microbiome, which is basically bacteria, fungi, all that. So these have interactions, they help each other, and that's how you have a, this uh, process takes place. So what are the pollutants for phytoremediations? If you see, the, uh, there are two kinds of pollutants, usually organics. Organics can be degraded. They are de degraded or transformed. This is non-degradable. 
metals can be degraded. They can only move from one to another. So that's why most of the time metal can be optic um, or it can be stabilized. So this is optic means inside plant. This is outside. As you see over here, it's very hard to see, you know, suitable for wetland treatment, suitable for phyto extraction and nutrient optics, hyper accumulator, suitable for phyto volatization. So um, volatization means it can just move and remove from the system. And as you see, arsenic, mercury, these are the things that works on that. Um, but if you look uh, look for, uh, well, mercury doesn't work. Let me take it back. Mercury stick with the uh, roots uh, more than it can move through it. It's very sticky with organic or sulfur. Um, and then if you think of hyper accumulator, these are basically most of the metals. And this is what I was talking about. Some plants have really high, or the they are very stable, even at very high concentrations. They are They will accumulate all these metals, still nothing will happen to those plants. So those are called hyper accumulators. As you see over here, many of the metals, nickel, copper, zinc. So these are hyper accumulation plant, you know, co cobalt, um, silver, mostly these three, you know, nickel, copper, zinc are the biggest um, heavy metals or the most um, commonly found heavy metals in soil. So mostly you are looking for what are the hyper accumulator, what kind of plants really take up those more and so then you look for them. So these are the those common of them. And, uh, and that's all. And then the last question was, or the most thing that you want to know is what kind of plants to use. And here is the list I gave you um, based on what kind of pollutants you have for a project, you can check here. Uh, just write the, as I say, you know, what are the mechanism? These are the different mechanism and uh, what media these are the pollutants, okay? So again, as you see over here, typically the pollutants are aromatics, chlorinated solvent, nutrients, and radioactive, uh, not radioactive, the explosive contaminants. Um, so those are the things over uh, we see over here. So no, come back. Um, <clears throat> so that's, Typical plants are written here. Um, and as you see, there are sunflower, everything else. And just check those. Um, criteria again, it has to accumulate the contaminants and it doesn't, should not uh, be toxic. The pollutants should not be toxic. The plant should survive. It should be low cost. No, it should not be too much irrigation requirement because that's expensive. It should be native. You don't want to have some kind of uh, um, um, invasive plant and the root length has to be long enough to get into the soil or contaminated zone. All right, so what we'll do is we'll take a break. Uh, we'll come back and talk about different cost and then we'll also do some calculations uh, before we go to the quiz or the quiz uh, answers. So let's meet, uh, it's 4.56, let's meet at 5.06. Let me pause it. Reading. All right, so now let's think of uh, how much it costs to have a phytoremediations. And uh, as you see over here, um, phytoremediation is the cheapest remediation technology that you can use uh, in most cases. So as you see over here, this is a cost range just to give you idea. Phyto remediation is ten to ten dollars to twenty five dollars uh, per tons of uh, water that we treated or soil. Let's see. Uh, the, mostly this one is for soil. And now question is, now this cost can vary. You know, it doesn't say much about uh, one of the things that you don't know will discuss is why it is so cheaper to have phyto remediations. Well, uh, if I ask you how much it costs to have a plant or have a garden there. You don't spend a lot of money. You just buy plants and you put it there and add some fertilizers, that's it. So that's exactly what phytoremediation is. You don't really have to do much. Uh, and we have been, you know, we know how to maintain gardens. So this is basically the same process. In fact, this is even least. 
Um, you don't have to, a lot of places you don't have to even irrigate. Uh, so most of the cost for phytoremediation comes from the idea that you have to monitor. Because if you don't monitor, how do you know whether it's working or not? Uh, so as you see, this is a um, um, phytoremediation can be order of magnitude lower than other type of treatments. Uh, but if, if the, it's lower than bioremediations, in situ bioremediations, because you have to inject uh, reagent, all that stuff. Phytoremediation is a sport plant. And as you see over here, there are different factors are written here. Um, advantage over uh, phytoremediations. And mostly if you see in the right side, phytoremediation cost, um, the design implementation cost is around 50,000. Then you have monitoring cost, monitoring equipment, five-year monitoring. Uh, so again, as you see, travel administrations, people, you know, what they do is that they're more expensive than actual materials because time is uh, cost. Uh, so either way, if you think of you now what's the cost of phytoremediation is 250,000, just an example here. But if you do the pump and treatments and with reverse osmosis, if you see the majority of the cost is uh, pump. And uh, then you have maintenance, operation cost, electricity, all that stuff. Uh, so phytoremediation is always cheaper. But um, the reason why people don't use it all the time is because of the constraint. So we'll discuss that. Um, so these are the advantage, disadvantage, least expensive. It can remove wide range of pollutants, uh, organics, metals. Um, it also can uh, treat contaminants in large area. Let's say you have acres and acres, hundreds of acres of land is polluted. It's very expensive to uh, treat uh, those areas. So what you do is you put plant and so that it can treat in the larger area with less cost. Easy to implement, as I said, one, if you grow plants, that's all it takes. It's a natural resource, it's a, it looks beautiful. Uh, that's why it's environmental friendly. You don't really have much side effect. In fact, this is the best thing you can think of. So that's why any places, if you have an option of phytoremediation, people don't go for other process. But then why it is not an effective strategy for many places? First, it takes long time. So if you want to use that land for something else, then you don't want to use phytoremediations because it's more expensive. Um, the time is expense. The land is expensive in, the, in a urban areas. You want to convert that land to something else. So you want to remove the pollutant as quickly as possible. Uh, so that's why that's another place you can't use it. Uh, and second thing, as you see, this is limited by the root penetration depth. Uh, if the root cannot reach there, phytoremediation doesn't work. So that's why it only works for shallow groundwater or shallow soils and sediments. You don't, if the contaminant has moved already deeper, you can't use phytoremediation. And it's also not effective for highly polluted area. Uh, the reason is you know, plants are also, you know, there is a limit for how much uh, plants can survive um, in, a, in a contaminated area. So if it is high concentration of pollutants, nothing will grow there. So that means you can't use it. And um, fourth is another factor, you know, climate. Uh, if you think of Los Angeles dry climate, you, it's very expensive to maintain plant. So that means, you know, it may not be efficient to, it's basically if you can grow plants, you have efficiency there. So climate is a big factor, soil is a factor. And then disposal of plant. At the end of the day, as you see, some plants will accumulate and you those means those plants has to be disposed of. But many conditions you instead of disposing, people do is they they pyrolyze it. When they pyrolyze is basically they produce um, carbon, charcoal, all that, and some of the metals can become ash. Uh, so it's it, this is one way. And then they can apply as a different uh, fertilizer, as long as these are organic pollutant. If it is metal, then you have to destroy or put in the landfill. <clears throat> but this is, a, so these are the advantage disparate that you have to think of. But now the last thing is design. So when I think of design, if you see what plant do, again, uh, it's a pump, right? So let's say this is a pollutants are in the groundwater. This is groundwater. And then you have soil okay and you have plants the roots can let's say shallow groundwater 
Uh, so the idea of how much pollutants you can remove, let's say this is pumping Q, um, and then, then you have a concentration of pollutant is C, okay? So if you see how much pollutant it can remove, usually mass of pollutant, mass of pollutants that can remove, it's easy to say that is Q times C, right? But that's, this is the amount of mass of water that can be pumped is this. But if you think of mass of pollutants, not necessarily pollutants are all the waters that has uh, gone through the uh, um, soil is not necessarily containing same concentration of pollutant. The reason is plant root is also a filtration system. They will not absorb all pollutants. They will discard, they will uh, reject some of the pollutants. So there is a acceptance level. That's like a gatekeeper, you know, so the roots has to uh, take those. So there is a factor here. So if you think of mass of pollutant, this should be Q times C, and then there is a factor here. There is a factor. This factor depends on the root. Um, whether root is uh, the root uh, is able to um, to accept those pollutants, or what fraction of the total pollutants can be trans uh, get into the root. So that's how it comes into. This is the total amount of pollutant. TSFCF is basically transpiration stream concentration factor. Basically, how what fraction of this is always less than one. One means everything can be removed. That's the uh, mass balance. So as long as you know this number and transpiration rate, that's basically how much liter of water that can be transferred from groundwater to uh, upstream or the evaporated, that's the transmission factor. See the concentration of pollutant in water um, or groundwater. Again, the pollutants are not removed from soil. They are removed from water. If they remove from water, the soil will leach those pollutants out. So that's why you know, it's a one more extra step. So as long as you know this one, you can calculate how much pollutants can be removed per, um, per day. Uh, so now let's do the example and see how it works. So this is a period, this is a table that gives you those constant. So let's say benzene. If you know benzene, benzene is a, a small simple molecules and uh, it has KOW, that means it says how sticky it is to organic. And um, it has also solubility, means how much it can dissolve in water. It has Henry constant, that means how much it can evaporate. And you have vapor pressure, it's a similar thing. Um, and then you have also transmission stream concentration factor. That depends on different plant, okay? So if you see this number, that's related to also octanal water coefficient. You see there is a equations given. Sometimes they are related, so uh, you can calculate that if you know KOW value for organics. Uh, um, but point is, you know the value. That means 71% of uh, what is uh, can be transferred into, into roots. And root concentration factor is basically how much it can absorb on the root, okay? Because some of them will stick in the root, on the root. So this is 0 0.71. So if you know all this value, you plug this value here, you should be able to get that mass calculations. And um, <clears throat> how long the cleanup time? That's basically how much pollutants can remove per day. Um, cleanup time is basically um, the amount mass remaining and how much it can be taken up per unit time. And usually this is a first order rate. Uh, that means the amount of pollutants can remove depends on a constant times the amount of pollutants are in the um, in the system, it's a negative sign because this is decreasing with time. So if you if you solve this one, that's a that's a simple first order equations. If you solve the time, that will be here. Okay. If you solve for time, this is basically minus k t is log m l m m by m zero. So T equal to minus one over K, ln M by M zero. Specifically, foster reaction that you already know. So this is not nothing 
uh, different. Uh, so that K is what we are going to calculate, uh, post order rate constants, uptake rate. Uh, so based on that, you should be able to calculate. So let's see example. Example one, TC residuals have been discovered in an unsaturated soil profile at a depth of three meters. So within three meters, you have TC is there. Um, uh, from lysimeter samples, lysimeter samples means you know you you it's the way to collect water um, uh, from soil, and the soil water concentration is approximately 100 milligram per liter. So that's the concentration C. Okay, this is C. Uh, long cutting of hybrid polar tree will be planted through uh, the waste at a density of 15. Uh, 100 tree per acre. So that's basically it says how many tree you have per unit area. Um, and phyto transformations of the TC waste. By the second and third year, the trees are expected to transpire three acre feet per year of water. So that's transpiration rate, uh, that equation you have, or 600 gallon per tree per year. So you have this many tree, then you can know how many, how much water basically. You just basically calculate how much water it can pump from ground. Uh, per acre, because you know the tree. Estimate the time required for the cleanup if the mass of the TC per acre is estimated 1,000 kilogram per acre. And cleanup standard has been set to 100 kilogram per acre, okay, or 90% cleanup. Okay, so that means you are given is M0 is kg per acre. MT is 100 kilogram per acre. So that means how long it will, um, you are basically asking for time. Okay, at the time. Uh, time you know, um, <clears throat> time is basically this, ln m0, uh, one over k. Let's see. Okay. So M, M0 is given. The only thing you don't know is K. And everything else that is given, you can calculate that K value. So let's put it here. K is, I wrote it here, all the factor given. Uh, I mean, basically, it's the solution. TC, TC, TS, CF equal to 0 0.74. If you see, that's um, the pollutant was TC. So if you see TC, that's here you see 74% efficient. So that's here, 74. And basically you calculate how much water per year per acre is going to be uh, transmitted um, because it says how much gallon of water per tree per year, then you know the number of tree, that's 1,500 tree per acre. Um, then you convert that acre uh, gallon to liters. So you basically get 3.5 million liter per acre per year. That's the amount of water transmitted, you know, the concentrations. So if you know all these values, you can calculate U, amount of load, amount of uptake rate. If you know U, that's the rate at which things are moving, divided by M0, that's K, is the value. So you calculate U, and substitute here, calculate K, and then you have to put this K to get the time. Everything else is just calculated, so that's one example. Any question? All right, so let's see another example. That's now a little bit different. Lead, uh, lead at a lightly contaminated brownfield site has a concentration in soil for 600 milligram per kilogram uh, to a depth of one feet. Uh, so this is a lead, this is a metal now. A cleanup standard has been set um, to 400 milligram per kilogram. So you have initial um, concentrations, initial concentration in soil so T equal to the initial is uh, 600. Then C time is 400 milligram per liter. Indian mustard or brassica, um, that's particularly uh, grass, will be planted, fertilized, and harvested three times each year for phyto extraction. The idea here is that metals will uptake that lead 
and assimilate in the body. Using small dose of EDTA, it is possible to achieve concentration in the plant, um, in the plants for 5,000 milligram per kilograms on the dry weight basis. So it's saying that this much a plant biomass can accumulate. Uh, EDTA is a, EDTA, what's the thing about EDTA? EDTA is a, is a challenge. Chelant means uh, it's a, or think of a molecule, organic molecule, which has many functional groups that can bind with lead. Uh, it's like hemoglobin is, is very good at binding iron and that iron is basically binding oxygen. So same way, uh, think of hemoglobin, it's a EDTA is a very similar structure. It can also bind um, that um, lead. So it's organic, organic, Um, basically, it can hold bind the lead. So if you add this one, it dissolves the leads from soil, and the soil then now it is dissolved. So that now uh, that plants can take those together, and harvested density um, for three tons of dry matter per crop. So every year you can create three tons of uh, soil soil or the plant, and three ton per plant means you know how much of lead is 500 milligram, all that stuff. Estimate the time required. So again, I put the solution here, you know, just basically, you know the rate, how much they can accumulate per year. And then the difference is the mass that you need to remove. And if you divide them, you'll get the time. And now all about is finding that U. U is the uptake rate. Uptake rate, you know, it's a 500 milligram per kilogram. That's the amount of each harvest will have. Um, then you have how much harvest, how much plants you have produced, nine tons per acre. Then multiply that one. And then you have these numbers, all these numbers are there, you know, just put those value. I, let me see anything else that I miss. Yeah, just take this one value and uh, you should be able to get those answers. But again, check later so that you know if you have any but basically it's a mass balance calculations. What's there, how much is removed, divided by what's the rate at which you are taking out, it will be uh, done. Again, I just want to confirm that phytoremediation is not viable for heavy places. You got to ask these questions for your project. Can it be cleaned up at a site below the action level? Because not necessarily it takes long time. Um, and what time scale, that's most important. If your time scale is very short, you can't use phytoremediations. Then you have to think of, does it create any toxic intermediates or product? Mostly plants don't, but sometimes they destroy and any bioremediation can break into something that could be more toxic. So you could check that one. Um, is it cost effective as alternative method? The reason you know that phytoremediation is cheap, so what the cost come here is because of the um, other factors like uh, time, okay? And then does the public accept the technology? Because you know sometimes uh, your client will be essentially looking for how things, how quickly things can be done so that can develop the land. And so then you have to think of all that aspect. And again, uh, case study, this is the handouts I uploaded. So you can see over here, it's APA uh, site. So the idea I put it here is so that you can see what kind of plants people normally use. As you see, they are kind of similar plant, same plant all over. Uh, sunflower, uh, Indian mustard. Uh, you see these uh, plants over here. You know, so then these are the things people use. So when you do your own phytoremediation project, project, at least you know these kind of sites there. And um, and again, just to give example, what they did, um, how this different way works. So these are the things I put it here. Again, this is for your reference. If you do use phytoremediation as one of your uh, remediation strategy. So long story short, if you think of phytoremediation, think of it as very cheap technology because you just grow plant, uh, but just know that it takes longer. So that means it's not short interval. You have to spend long time uh, to get it right. So that means, you know, if you're not going to use that land very soon, uh, otherwise you can use phytoremediations. But you can combine with phytoremediation and other technology. Uh, for instance, you can scrape all the highly polluted soil so that now you have low contamination soil and then you uh, grow plant there. Again, it depends on a lot of variability, climate, 
um, time survivals, time now types, how they takes, what they do. You have to think of all that. Okay. Um, there are some methods that can be taken by plant, so that means you can use it. There are some organics that can work, you know. So you got to think of all that aspect of it. So that's all for the phytoremediations. Now what I'll do is I'll go over the quiz so that because uh, uh, the quiz answer. So any question before then? Is there research on like plants that are like genetically altered so that they're better at phytoremediation? Is that a thing? Uh, um, no, uh, the reason is it's very difficult to get approval for genetically modified plants to be used there. Um, um, normally people are more, um, it's like, you know, they think it's invasive species. What is the other consequence? Nobody knows. So it's a, um, it is a viable technology, but I don't know, at least I am not aware of. Uh, I'm sure this is some people are trying, um, but that's a regulatory limitations because you, they normally go for something less invasive and something you all know. Um, but it can be, you know, why not? Because we we, uh, we make genetically modified crop already. Um, so I can see that, but I don't know whether it's, uh, people are actually doing research on, or um, the um, amount of effort needed is not worth enough for a lot of um, companies just to build plants for the remediations as opposed to food productions, but it's possible. Any other question? Okay, so let me um, share the quiz two results. I release it, um, but I just want to mention that the average is lower than the last exams. Uh, last exam, the average was nine. This time mean is um, seven and the uh, standard deviation is 1.33. So I'm just going through the questions just to show, but here I uh, give you a distribution. So you know, 56 students attended the quiz um, um, out of 58. So two, two students didn't attend. And um, you can see which questions most students have difficulties. Um, so this is the, this this is what it means now. That means if 67 percent or 68 percent student got it right in the question one. Question two, 17, only 18 percent. Uh, 18 percent. So I'm just going to read the question for again just to see if there is any issues related to that. But um, so this is the only question I see um, a lot of students have difficulties. And then there are question number five. Almost everybody got it right. Question five and seven. And then this is another distribution. Number eight was harder. But overall, uh, it was hard quiz for many students. This is the distribution, as you see. Um, so let's go through the answers. The temperature of the hydraulic of the water would increase. How would hydraulic conductivity of the soil changes? So hydraulic conductivity, if you know, this increase the, that depends on the, on the increasing conductivity and the, and the density. Um, as well as viscosity. Viscosity. So if you, if your viscosity, um, I think this the opposite. It's writing wrong way. Time viscosity divided by um, density or specific gravity. So that means if your viscosity is, is not viscous, then the water will flow more easily. So that's how the temperature is. Temperature doesn't affect intrusing permeability, which is soil property, but it does affect water properties. Uh, water can be less viscous if it's high temperature. So there is small change in that. Uh, so um, if the vis temperature increases, viscosity increases, the usually the answer is increased. Very small amount, but it does. Um, if soil A has high organic carbon than soil B, um, the retardation factor of an inert pollutant in a soil A would be higher than soil B. Is this true or false? Uh, so uh, I say that you no know, retardation factor. If you see what is the retardation factor, is is um, KD 
one plus KD power density divided by uh, porosity. Okay. So this KD is what the organic carbon means now. KD is fraction of organic carbon times KOC. So if you see retardation factor, it it it, um, it means that if it is absorbed in a pollutant on the soil, then the retardation factor will increase. The more absorption that's KD, it will increase if that's the case. But here I said the retardation factor of in pollutants non-absorbing, that means it doesn't stick with soil. So that means KD equal to zero. So if KD equal to zero, R equal to one, there is no absorption, it doesn't change. So that means it's not going to change if just because your soil change, because it doesn't stick. So um, that answer will be false. Next question is between linear and friendly isotherm, which isotherm is suitable to predict exhaustion of adjacent site at high concentrations? So if you think of linear, what does that mean? Contaminant concentrations is directly proportional to the concentration of pollutant. Friendly, on the other hand, it says this is friendly. Okay. So if you plot this one, if your concentration increases, contaminant concentration will equal increase everywhere. Now, so this is Q. But if you plot the Q over C, that means it says that what it means that it, it will increase, but it will not be the same. That as, as you go higher and higher, the more contaminant you add, it's very harder to harder to go to soil because getting exhausted. Um, so between linear friendly, you know, and another is linear. Linear doesn't linear assume that if you continue to increase, the more and more contaminant will. So it doesn't assume that there will be no exhaustion. Um, because of this shape, you know, that factor. Uh, so whether it's a friendly or Langmuir, that's where it it, it, it assumes that there will be some, some way or other it will be exhaust at some point or it will become difficult to absorb more and more. Um, so linear for sure, that's like another way to say, you know, linear is never the answer uh, because it means it never existed. The more you increase, it will increase. Confined aquifer A has a higher hydraulic conductivity than aquifer B, which aquifer would have higher radius of influence during pumping at the same pumping at the same rate, assuming that the same head at the pumping well. So basically I'm asking is you have aquifer A and B, one is more conducting, another is less conducting. So if your conducting is increases, what happens here? You are pumping, right? So if you pump as you as you, it's like, you know, how far you can pump, how, it's where the water can drop, you know. So if it's high, highly hydraulic conductivity, it will flow much faster. If it flow much faster, the radio of influence or things will grow much faster. So that's why it will experience the, the head will drop at the farther distance. But if your K is low, you can't really pump. That means, you know, it doesn't really affect the larger distance. You can only pump for the nearby. Uh, so that's what it asks, which aquifer would have high hydraulic radius of influence. So the one with highly hydraulic conductivity. So the K is high, so that means radius of influence will be higher. Circle the chemical that is the best oxygen based on E0 provided. Best oxidants means you have more energy. So, so that's the, if you see the E0, which one is the highest E0? E0 should be higher, that means the more energy it has, so that's ozone. And if you, even if you don't know the E0 value, we can see that ozone is most reactive because it must have that, uh, that's the based on energy. That's why, you know, it's, uh, it's, con it's very efficient at degrading pollutant. So chlorine is not as reactive as ozone and oxygen, obviously, it can waste. Which one of the activated carbon would have higher capacity? Um, so we have two form, powder versus granular. Uh, as you see, the, the adsorption is a surface process. So that means if you have more surface area, it will adsorb more. Uh, so if you even pack anywhere, it can pack long more. So that's why it has more capacity um, per unit um, if you pack them the way. Okay, so that's a powder because of surface. 
area that can be exposed uh, to uh, to water. So if you mix them, it will have much higher absorption. What would happen to the stripping factor if water flow increases? Again, stripping factor, if you remember, S is a, a Henry constant time Q air divided by Q water. So if you increase the flow rate, the stripping factor would decrease. So again, um, this ABC can vary based on what you see in your, um, because um, that change, um, but at least, you know, if as long as you decrease is your answers. Um, what would happen to the stripping factor if the temperature of water increases? So if the temperature increases, you know that Henry constant is very easy to, ex ex um, um, Henry constant would increase. It would more go to the gas is quickly. Uh, so that means uh, the it's easy to strip out stuff from from water um, if it is high temperature. So that's one of the factor design factor. You can warm the groundwater uh, for things to increase. So stripping factor would increase. Um, the last two. Which are the? Wait, I have a question real quick. I, I thought the dimensionless Henry constant would decrease with increasing temperature. Isn't it like Henry constant equals dimensionless Henry constant times uh, temperature and then uh, R? Let me check that equations. Normally, it depends on how the Henry constant is written. Um, Henry constant, if it is written as a concentration in air divided by concentration in water, then, then obviously that's going to increase, okay? So the one we always use is that uh, air to water. But I know okay. one equation or thing, I'll go back and check, okay, what's that uh, equation is. But that's a good point, because I remember there is a question somewhere we wrote to convert from one like atmosphere to this formula. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. The last two, which of the following exit treatment is appropriate to if the pollutant consists of many carbon atoms? So if the carbon is high, that means you know that uh, it's most likely will absorb to another carbon. Uh, if you do air stripping, it's not volatile, so it's not going to work. So air stripping is not a solution. Advanced oxidation versus carbon absorption. Again, if your carbon is high, it stick with much faster. Uh, if you have oxidant, it still will work, but you need a lot of oxidant, uh, lots of uh, strong or oxidation or contaminants, or chemicals. So absorption is more efficient because of more carbon. It stick, KD is much higher. Now, C12, that means KD is much higher because it increases with number of carbon, right? Um, the last one is the hydraulic gradient is constant in a groundwater aquifer, then would uh, Darcy's velocity change based on the distance between well? Um, so Darcy's velocity, if you see, is, um, is basically Q over area. And if you know what is Q, that's Q equal to K and I, dH over D L or this is hydraulic gradients. So if the hydraulic gradient increases, B D would increase. So let's see what happened. So it says that the hydraulic gradient is constant in groundwater aquifer. That means D H D L well is not changing with distance. It's the same slope all over. So whether you have a distance like, so what it's saying is whether you have longer distance or not, the hydraulic gradient is changing the same way. So that means if your distance between well is different, doesn't matter, it, you know, it's all it's about dH over dL, it's a slope, the slope is constant. So based on that, you know, it's not going to change. Um, so that's the final answer. Uh, I. I want to just mention, I know that you know, some of you might think you know, it's a low score or that, but if you think as a whole class, it's not going to affect that much if you, it's just the one quiz. 
and first best of three quiz will be taken. So you can have one bad quiz. And second, if you don't have a bad quiz, it's just, if you see, it's uh, probably less, it's around 5%. So when you score seven, you got very small point, like less than 1% or around that. So you still have 99% to score from. So I would not um, um, worry too much about this one. Uh, just do well for the next quiz as well as the midterms. Midterms will be, you know, I think uh, if you've done homework, you should be doing uh, do very well. And again, do the homework in Excel or so that you can plug the value and you can get the answer. So it's easier for you to don't have to type even again or don't have to do calculator, do all these calculations. Um, so it's, it is what it is. You know, I, I think, you know, I also like to know, uh, like one of you mentioned, where you get confused. These are the feedbacks, I, it's important. Uh, so provide feedbacks anonymously or directly you know, where you thought the question was confusing or any way so that I also change questions. Uh, next time when I ask question, I think of those, um, those feedback. Because I know that in one of the quiz, one student lost the point because the question was like A equal to A, B equal to B, C equal to C, that's how I enter. But um, to see at resuffle it. So some people see A equal to B. Uh, so um, I know that's, that could easily get it wrong. Uh, so I was very, um, I was very careful this time when I said question so that that doesn't happen. Uh, so your feedbacks are important. Again, I'm, you know, the testing is the part of it. You know, this is a project oriented class. Uh, so I want you guys to take quiz as a way uh, for your own learning assessment, as well as my own method of teaching. I, I like to improve. Uh, so your feedbacks are important. Give me feedbacks on any times, you know, any times you feel like you don't understand. I need to know how it is, you know. So that's all as far as today's class. Um, uh, so I'm gonna stop recording, but if you have any question, I'll stick around because I know I'm meeting one group uh, for the for the their project.